Welcome to Let's Talk About It, a podcast that gets a platform for real talk, real people, real topics, real conversations. Enjoy the show and enjoy this journey. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Let's Talk About It, a podcast that gets a platform for real talk, real people, real topics, real conversations. Today, I'm not going to put scripts, I had it all scripted, but I'm not going to do it today. Today, I am in Arizona. I am going to interview my son. He's had an amazing journey from Little League to professional baseball, and he is a fantastic, admiring chef today. He's going to talk about his up and down roller coaster journey, which has been eventful. I've seen a lot of it, but I want him to tell his journey, how he came up from Little League all the way up to where he is today. He's a married man. He has a beautiful young son and a very nice wife. Sometimes, like, nah, I, I love her to death. <laughs> She's my daughter-in-law, Julie. I love her. I'd like to introduce my son, Brandon Jenkins. What's up? How y'all doing? All right. Listen, this is a very, it's a very uh, important podcast for me because I, I wanted to get your journey. Okay, you know, you and I have been up and down the baseball road for many, many years. I mean, from Little League, high school, college, you know, I watched you up and down. I watched you, you know, have great success, bad times, great times. I watched you fall in love, get married, become a father. So I want to get your story how way you see it. Because I know I, I can tell it all type of ways, but nobody experienced it like, like you did. So, you know what I mean? I want to start off, what can you, let's start off like where, where you're from. You was born and raised in Jersey. You was born in Cherry Hill, but you grew up in Magnolia, New Jersey. Tell, tell us about your experience living in one square mile of friendliness in Magnolia, New Jersey. Mm. Well, talk as loud as you want. Honestly, Magnolia was very uneventful. But I just, I always felt like it was a small town feel when I was growing up. Mm-hmm. Like when I was growing up on, what, like, what was it, 415 South Warwick Road? Yep. Yep. I still remember the address. Like, I just was so oriented with just going to school, hanging out with friends, playing ball, just like doing what kids do in like a communal setting. And it was fun. It was real fun. You know, we, we had some family ups and downs back then, but we carried it through pretty strong. You know, I love Magnolia. I love Magnolia a lot, especially going, especially going to school. With my uh, school, especially going to school with my friends. That's where it, that's where it shaped my personality. I give a lot of credit to my half uh, to uh, to my brother. He's my half brother, but I call him uh, my my brother. His name's Lewis, and I give him a, a lot of credit because he shaped my personality from a very young age when I was uh, like five years old, going upwards to like I think thirteen is when he. We unfortunately left us but he's still alive but you know he just he had his own <laughs> he had his own journey he had his own he had his own journey he had to go around but gotcha it was a it was a really fun time I, i'm i was really magnolia cemented my personality the kids there they were just a little bit quirky it was always like uh there was three three main towns in one town that was kind of like yeah, this was a long time ago. Um, Magnolia, Somerdale, Stratford. Stratford was like peak high. Somerdale was kind of like middle, middle of the pack. They, some were really good, some were really bad. And then Magnolia was kind of like the nerds, not really that important. Bottom of the barrel, everything. And Mount Laurel was just kind of out there. But oh god. And then when when we all we used to play like intersectional sports and stuff like that, Magnolia will always come on the bottom. And then when I came up, when I came up in the in the little leagues, it just it just changed everything. I think my class was like the was the class that started like getting Magnolia on the map again. Like wait, we're not all just nerds. We're not all just like I wouldn't say nerds, but like just Stratford always had the most money, most wealth, like. Mm. Best best athletes, 
best uh, best educational systems, like best coaches that have been there for thirty years teaching at middle schools, oh, like SAO, correct? Yeah, SAO, and you know their parents were toxic because they thought they were the shit and everything like that. So, how was Magnolia like? Like the, the, the whole general, like going to school with your friends and stuff like that. How was that? It was cool. I liked it a lot. I liked it a lot. I mean, yeah, you guys were just one school, like the first to eighth grade or something like that. It was a it was a unique setup. There was pre it was pre K through eighth grade. Yeah, it was pre K through eighth grade, and I went I went all the way from pre K all the way through. No, I went through all the way from kindergarten through eighth grade. And I went to Kids Castle up the street for pre K. It's a pretty it was a pretty unique system, and I got to meet a lot of eighth graders went on during recess and. I just had some of the best times I had in my life were in Magnolia. That's yeah, where yeah. I was like the most popular. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if it just accounted to my personality or just who I was. Maybe it was baseball or something like that. But yeah. I think that had a lot to do with it. So, what do you remember about you know Magnolia Little League? Because that that's what all started. I mean, I don't know how much you remember about T-ball, but I can tell everybody the first time he played T-ball, he sucked. Absolutely fucking terrible. <laughs> but. I do. I don't know how much he remembers T-ball. I know, but once he finished his second year of T-ball, he started to become good. So, like, besides that, like, what are your memories about, like, being in Magnolia Little League from, like, coach pitch, minors, majors? You got any memories about it? I love Little League. That was one of my favorite times. That was one of my favorite times in Magnolia because I feel like it was we had we had a lot of parades. And it, even if it wasn't baseball oriented, it was always us like going down to the local baseball fields and us having field day, or us going to like having local carnivals, doing pop up carnivals in the junior field. Like there was, it was like a ranking system. There was a, a bat. Well, back in the day before the t-ball field was installed and the softball field got updated, it was minor league field with a big green with a big fake green monster in right field <laughs> and then there was just a whole bunch of woods and a crappy softball field a really crappy junior field and the only shining grace was our major league field i didn't even think we had a parking lot in the in the right field back then because it was just all filled with trees yeah but I I loved it. Magnolia literally was one of my favorite times in my life. Like I, I I didn't always have a lot of success, especially early on. But as I started to pick up and started getting more like physical, I started using more brute force. I started like becoming like a uh, let's say a superstar in the league. See, he became a superstar, Magnolia. League. <laughs> it wasn't that hard to do. I mean, there was, I mean, there was only like ten people in the fucking league. But. <laughs> What do you remember the most, right, about, let, let's go back to the minors and stuff like that. Because you only played, like, one year in the minors. And then you played, then I, I think I put you up in the majors. You was at an early age, playing at 10, playing with the early, with the older kids. So how would you feel, if you can remember, like, playing with older kids at 10 years old? If you can remember. I do remember it. I, I kind of felt sad because I didn't get to play with my friends. Mm. I didn't, well... It, you know what? That was I think that was the first time I actually started getting used to playing un- in uncomfortable situations. Like instead of being with my friends and playing the same age bracket, I would play up, and then all of a sudden, like me and my friends would like just meet, and we would just go eat the snack stand, just goof <laughs> off for like thirty minutes after the game or something like that. Tyler Crumpton or AJ Ballinger was in the minor league field, and they would come see me in the major league field. I maybe get a bat here and there, but it was hard. I remember that. I mean, I kind of, I didn't really get a, a lot of good time on the minor league field because I wanted to hit more home. I wanted to hit a home run on the on the minor league field. Never got a chance to do that. But I, honestly, the the biggest thing I will say, I didn't like the older kids because I felt like back in the day it was more so like physical bullying. Mm. And there's this guy named Matt Mignano, and he apologized to me for it. But back in the day, he was really bad. He was really bad bully on the team. <laughs> I, I I could tell you from one part. You know, I I, I do feel a little guilty about it because like I I brushed him up a lot. You know, he was getting better, and you know, now thinking about it now now listening to you now, I wish I would have kept you another year in the minor so you could play with your friends. Because at that age, it's all about having fun with your friends. I don't think so, but like, I, I don't. Because he was good at times. If you think about it, like 
people. I, I just don't think there would be anything I would have gained. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, cause you went up to the majors, you did good. So I did, I did well. I did. I didn't. I wasn't the best on the team because we had Chaz, we had Doc, we had Matt Mignano back then, and he was pretty decent. And then we had we had a couple of guys. Uh, oh, what's his name? Oh, Gruber. Yeah, Gruber. Gruber. We had yeah. Michael Gruber. He was really good. Dude, we had a lot of we had a lot of good guys on the twelve year old team, and I. I got to see a lot of great. I got to see a lot of great players, and I guess it's weird in the prime of their little league career. Yeah. As weird as that sounds, but it taught me like what I wanted to be like, and I wind up being like Doc was one of the. He just hit the ball really far, really, <laughs> really far. I'm just I want to be like that one day. Let's get into to uh, your first travel ball experience. With the Eve Shan Roadrunners, what do you remember about that little travel team? I think he was like 11, 12. Um, I remember having a lot of t-shirts. <laughs> I put a travel ball team together. Uh, you know, it was with, uh, you know, through Running Me and Magnolia. Um, you know, to give them more experience, more, just to, just get them better out there. Uh, Eve Shan Roadrunners. Uh, you know, we had good times, you know, Myrtle Beach, we went to Myrtle Beach, uh, mm -hmm. we had all type of stuff like that, but I want to get into past that part. We're going to get past that part, and we're going to talk about, I want to get into when you finally got a chance to be with the Mammoth Militia and go to Cooperstown. Because I want to hear, if you remember when you went to Cooperstown 12 years old, that's every baseball kid's dream to go to Cooperstown Dream Park. Like, what was your experience like going to Cooperstown Dreams Park at 12 and being with the new kids? You can spend the night out on your own in the dorms. Like, what, what do you remember about those days? Well, I'll speak on the, a little bit on the Roadrunners. Okay, go ahead. I love the Roadrunners. I thought that was a really good team. It was like uh, the best of, best of Stratford, Somerdale, uh, Magnolia, and picked apart from like Linden Ball, all, all that shit, like everywhere. And then just all uh, conducted on um, one team. And I loved it. I, lo I loved that. I loved that team. It was, it was really good. It was really good. I mean, we had a lot of anger issues on the team for some reason. A lot of fa the, the father and daddy ball was just out of this fucking world. But yeah, it, it, we did a lot. We went to Aberdeen with Rehoboth a lot. We went to Myrtle Beach. We went to a lot of local tournaments. That's why I say I have a lot of T-shirts because we would we would get like second place in these. Like I remember the first championship we won, we tied. Mm. We the first championship we won, we tied, and then the next I think like a couple tournaments after that, we finally won one. We had a lot of potential. It's just it was all up here for a lot of us. And thank God a lot of those kids on the team actually went on to play a little really good ball. But in terms of Monmouth Militia and going to Cooperstown. I think that's when my insecurity in baseball started to manifest. What do you mean? Because, like, I loved, I loved the game at that point. I knew I was good. I knew I threw hard. But I did too much. And I, w I felt like everybody was expecting a lot of me. And in reality, nobody was expecting anything from me. And I put... I noticed that at a young age, what I didn't realize is that I put a lot of pressure on myself every every day like if i went up to if i went up to the plate i would i'd be like dude i gotta hit a home run every single time if i go up to pitch i gotta strike out everybody every single time i gotta be the hardest thrower i gotta be i gotta hit the farthest home run i gotta get here i gotta get there and then i remember like uh we had like you know equal shared tournaments where uh like before the tournament we had like a competition on who can hit the most home runs that would be the person that would be in the home run derby whoever did this could be in this whoever did that could be in that blah 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 whatever i didn't get selected to anything because i would just that's where it started and it just manifested and it got my 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 ego became so brittle during right. that time yep and i actually didn't really do that well in cooperstown i hit a home run but it was i was like the only the only thing i did good this I, I never knew. I, I I never knew you felt like that. No, I I definitely felt like that. Now looking, being older now, and actually like looking back at like where my life started to, where my baseball career started to become. To appear. I I knew it from that forward because I knew I was the best on every team. 
fit like talent wise and I knew I had a lot of potential but I didn't know how to use that potential and I and a lot of people had like they saw the arm they saw the bat couldn't really run that well couldn't jump that well but I could hit it really far and I could throw it really hard so they were just expecting a lot out of me so I expected a lot out of myself well I, I I, I'm glad you shared that because I, I can tell you, like, you know, as a parent, you know, I was there, like, you know, when I was with your mother, she was there, she enjoyed it, you know, your sister was there, uh, we enjoyed the whole experience, but, you know, as a parent, we don't know what you guys go through, you know, we, we really don't know, and it's the first time, it's been, God, I don't know, how many years ago, like, almost 15 years ago, I've never known that, that you felt that way, and you was like 12 years old. And I, I can't really... I, I, it would have happened regardless because that's just my that was my personality back then. Like, and a lot of it had to do with my mom coddling me. I, if I had one, if I had one thing that I could change, like I love my mom. I think she's a great mom. She does she doesn't do anything wrong. But if I had one, if I were to change one thing, it would be to really step up and be my own man. Get a job. You know, do do more things, push myself to do do more uncomfortable things, push myself into more uncomfortable situations, because I really held myself back a lot, yeah. and and like I think that's when it first started, like when I stopped, uh, when I, I just would get so insecure about things. I'd be like, dude, I'm the like I would just see other people perceive me as like, oh man, this guy's gonna go major league one day. Yeah. And there'd just be a lot of expectation. And I just would be scared of those expectations. Now I just don't care. Well I, 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 I can tell you as a parent, you know, when, when, when even me and your mom, we, we, we didn't know. We we uh we, we both actually could have did more for you and, 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 and let the, the the reins both go on you. But like as a parent, and, and like you're a parent now, like you're going to want to protect your kid no matter what. You're you're going you're going to want to protect them, and you know, and moms always gonna be like that for the for, for the baby boys. It's like dads there for their girls. You know, you know. I know we could have probably did a better job of trying to like let you be more and more independent and trying not to protect you so much. But I, I'm I'm glad you told us that. I mean, that, that's that's something that, you know, we need to hear as a parent, especially now you've been a parent. Now, you know, what to do with, with, with your son. You know what? He's perfect. I'm not I'm not blaming anybody. I'm, I just, got I'm just I'm just saying, like, it was inevitable. It was going to happen regardless the way I was the way my trajectory was back then. I wish I start. I wish I, I wish I sucked longer. I really wish I sucked longer and I was a late bloomer. So that way I could. Speaking from a baseball standpoint, I could get more control. I could get more dominance in the zone. And then once I hit that growth spurt, I would just erupt with talent out of nowhere. And then everybody, all eyes were on me. I wish it happened backwards. I wish I didn't get it all in, all in the beginning. Yeah, I, I get it. So, so you went from there to, I think, your first test for me, really learned the game of baseball with South Jersey Young Guns, with, with Coach Pat Fisher. That, that was tough. Pat to me was probably one of the best coaches you ever had. But like, how did you feel about being with a, a well-established travel ball team in South Jersey Young Guns? Structure and fish was no joke. Yeah, you know I mean, and I know he, he was on you a lot. But like, but at that age, like, if you can remember, how was your experience like being with the Young Guns and being trained by him and playing with him? You know, growing up, I didn't really like the parents a lot. I try to stay away from the parents as much as I could hmm. um being with Fisher he was the first coach that just like didn't well him and Joe Barth but like, he was another one um those two people Pat Fisher and Joe Barth were the only two people that just did not give an absolute shit about parents what they felt like how if their kid was playing if they paid three thousand dollars a season and their kid wasn't playing they just didn't give a shit and that's what I respected the most about them is that the real players play, and if you want to play, then you got to be good. You can't just pay to play, and that's that's what I truly loved about those guys. And I remember my first day, I hit some, I hit um their best player or one of their best players. I think it was Burke, something Burke in the hand. They call, used to call him Berkey, and I hit him in the head. I'm like, fuck, like, and there, he just kind of was up to me and just like, he's like, dude, just calm down. We know you throw hard. We did the scouting report. And then next thing you know, I'm on the team 
and I didn't even play on the A team. I played on the D t- or D team or C team C or whatever. Team. Yeah. And I was on the C team. I was like, why? Like, I'm I'm too good. Like, this is the first time I've ever been on a C team. And it was the development. It was a developmental team. And I got a lot of reps. And during those group practices, Fisher was really hard on me. I, I like, I would run laps. Like, if I did even, like, a smidge thing wrong, like, I'd be the first one out. Like, I'd be the first one to be talked to. I'd first one to be yelled at. And, like, it really straightened me out. Like, it really made me take the game super serious. And that's why, like, I, try, I struggle coaching kids, uh, like, when I, whenever I get a chance to coach kids because I'm just too intense. I'm, I'm too intense, and not a lot of kids can handle it. Like, you got that from from, from Fish and all that? I got that from, from Fish and Joe because it works. It works for, for truly talented kids. It works. Like, if you are just not, like, you need to be thick-skinned to play baseball. You, you got to. Like, a lot of kids nowadays... They, they think they want it, but they don't. Their parents want it more than them, and it shows. Like, when they get to the when they get to the field, they don't stretch. They just want to goof off. And when I got to the field with the young guns, it was like, dude, like, you got to be here 15 minutes early. If you're not, it's because your parent was late. And, you know, just because your parent was late, that still wants you hustling to the field. Like... And then we would stretch. We would do dynamic warm up. That was the first time I did dynamic, static, all all the bullshit. Like how to do infield, outfield, how to do bunt drills, how to do all this stuff. It was the first time I ever got a real lesson in how to play the proper game of baseball, and that's why I respected him so much. So right, and, and you referenced Joe Barf. You know, he was with the you know, Tri State Arsenal, a <laughs> uh, powerful um, organization in Jersey, uh, nationally known as well. Uh, Older gentleman been coaching baseball. Fuck, I don't know. <laughs> Shit, that, that man, he's still, he's, he's still probably coaching baseball over 60, 80 years now. But, you know, you, you, you touched on him. Like, like you touched on Fisher, right? But what, what did Joe do for you? I love Joe. I think he's a really good guy. I, I think he could be an asshole sometimes. Like, but, I mean, what good coach isn't? Like, he's... They're not there to be your friend. They're there to coach you to be better. And as soon as you get that through your head, it's just, it's better off that way. You know, I'm a chef now. So it's like, your chef's not there to be your friend. They're there to get you better. They're that, well, a true good chef is there to get you better. Same thing with a good coach, you know? Like it, with him, it was, he was very old, very old school, but he was also, also up with, updated with the times. He would motivate coaches. He would motivate the kids. He would motivate the parents. He would go up to the parents and just like not give a shit like what you thought about him. Like he was, he was like the first like Young Guns was a national level team, sure, but he was the most stru- like structured national level team. He had like thirteen U, fourteen U, sixteen U, eighteen U, all going to national tournaments. I'm just like, dude, and they're winning them. Like they're number one. Like eighteen U was number one. We were number one in the nation at one point. Uh, 13 you was number one in the nation at one point and we have practiced with these kids in this big like in this big uh little uh indoor facility like right I, i'm not sure where the fuck it was strap i'm not sure Voorhees. Strap, Voorhees, Voorhees, and every everybody that would well that would come back from florida be like oh congratulations back to work it was like very like business as usual like it was it was totally different from the young guns young guns had like a had a like a classic like classic baseball hey let's go to the field let's warm up let's do this let's do that old school way but theirs is just like you go in winning is winning is business this is a business they were like very forward thinking they were the first they were like one of the first people on radar guns first people on pull downs for one of the first people to like really like try to develop kids that wanted to be developed like i have never like jay groom was on the arsenal was on arsenal at the time and I used to think I was like, I still was on the same talent level as him. And when I noticed separation, when I started to notice separation from me and him was at Arsenal. It was actually crazy. Yeah, I I love that. I love that team. I love that team more than the Young Guns, in my opinion. So at this point, right, you've already played with Young Guns. You've already played with Arsenal. Like, how do you think you was as a player, starting from Magnolia, to get to that level of with the Arsenal and Young Guns, like how you think you were as a player? Shitty. 
That was really bad. Really? I don't think I was good. I think I, I think I, physically I was good. My IQ sucked. That's crazy. You know, this is a lot. It's just a lot to my story. It's a little crazy. But yeah. um, I remember why I went to that one Florida Florida thing when I was 13 years old, and I flew out. It was actually before. I think it's after I got diabetes, and I flew out to Florida, and I stayed in a bunk. I stayed in a like a team bunk or team dorm, and I like ran through like a whole week straight on like what no it was three eight three eight thing three eight camp on from i think it was from 8 a.m to 9 a.m 9 p.m and being a pro baseball player now i just that that's bullshit like you don't do that but it was just like fielding games baseball iq training batting cages pitching fielding again like batting again scrimmages cross like cross play like bunt defense analytical defense like that when i was 13 that taught me the real like real business about iq baseball iq but even then i was just i took it for granted then going on 15 years old like i just i look i look at myself when i was 14 15 i thought i sucked because not because i couldn't throw hard not because i couldn't do shit i was very i was very talented but that's all i had I didn't. I didn't really like have substance. I didn't really like, like, I didn't really like put effort into just like knowing where I needed to be on a ground ball. Like baseball IQ is the most important thing of the game. You can't survive on talent alone in baseball. So let's go back to when you were thirteen. You know, we all found out. You know, uh, you know, your mom was concerned about you having like certain symptoms and stuff like that and I know it's the two right when you use at the baseball field and right when I got the phone call you know mom called me up and said you know took you to the hospital you got tested you know you got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes uh, we didn't know no none of us knew we were scared this and that right so if you if you can go back and remember like at, at that point how did you feel when like when you first was diagnosed with that because as a parent you know, me and your mom, we were scared as hell. I, we didn't understand it. We was like, oh my God, he's gonna go, whatever. But if you can remember as a kid, like, you know, dealing with that at that age. Well, I remember I peed the bed a lot. I went to bed a lot. And I just like, I'm like, this is not normal. I don't know why I'm drinking a case of water, like a day, like this is not normal. Because I would eat Chinese food, and I would just like always go to the bathroom like 10, 12, 15 times a day. I'm like, dude, this is not normal. Like, and then I wouldn't think anything of it. I was just like, hey, maybe I'm just normal, whatever. Like, just doing business as usual. Then I really noticed it at a baseball game when I was like, for some reason, it was weird. Because literally a week or two after <laughs> I went to the doctor's appointment. Um, I drank I drank a Gatorade the fastest I possibly could. I'm just like, dude, I got off second base. I was feeling a little woozy, not tingly or anything like my actual symptoms, but and I just got back to the I got back to the dugout. I was just like, shit, like why do I feel like this? And I was like, I got to get something to eat, like reflexively, like instinctively. And then I told you to get me a Gatorade. You got me a Gatorade. I was like, okay, I'm fine. I'm like, why? Like, wow, that's weird. Like that is so weird. Um. Long story short, I went to the hospital after I got diagnosed. I thought I was gonna die. Then I realized that type one diabetes just simply isn't like that. Like you don't die from it. You can long term, but you know, if you take care of yourself, you're fine. Um, I was schooled on how like on how to take care of myself, drink lots of water, um, exercise, ex exercise, make sure you keep your, your blood sugars down and everything like that. I just I never thought I never have a defeatist I don't have a defeatist attitude I don't have like like I can't do things like I was just like how can I make it work for baseball that was like the first thing in my mind how can I make it work how can I eat like as it was always eating baseball eating baseball eating baseball like those two things were always in my head and as long as I could eat my Chinese food and play baseball I was all right <laughs> yeah you right? do like Chinese food even to this day you still eat Chinese food yeah, we had it yesterday <laughs> so we went through all that, right? And that's his, his meter right there for diabetes, right? And you, you have managed it very well since you're 13 years old to now. I mean, but, you know, being that, being that young, 
and going because because back then, but like, you, you was doing with the insulin with the needles, and you had to be trained to do that. I mean, that that's pretty good. Thirteen figuring that out and like measuring. I remember how we used to measure it out, like you know, because you wanted to have certain Chinese food, certain meals, mm -hmm. and, and we try to figure out with the calculations and shit. You know, that, that, that's actually a good thing right there, man. Well, once you once you figure out what's what's like what causes carbs and what you have to dose for, you don't have to measure anything on nutrition nutrition facts and stuff. It, it was just very strict on the nutrition facts. You can do that for the rest of your life, sure. Like, but I just don't want to limit myself like that because, like, you can have chicken and broccoli with fried rice from eight like three different restaurants, and they'll all be the different different nutrition facts. So you cannot. Not everybody's going to have nutrition facts. Not everybody's going to have the carbohydrates, the serving counts, the the servings per per dish. Like maybe you got a new cook that day, and that cook is going to like look at the food and like serve you a bigger portion than normal. You just got to react on the fly, okay. and like there's just certain things I don't teach you in in the in the hospital. Like like did you know almonds or popcorn naturally lowers your blood sugar? Like. Um, Chinese food because there's like four or five different types of sugars, natural sugars in it. Like it boosts up your your blood sugar larger than normal. Like I, you go, you just got to know that through experience. And I, I had to. It. Well, you know, wait, wait, you're doing a good job maintaining now, especially throughout your baseball career. So let's get back to this. You know, when you was with the Tri-State Arsenal, I, I forgot how old you was, 14, 15. Uh, you yeah. you did something. For the first time ever, you know, you went down to the Perfect Game Freshman World Championships. It was the first time they had the tournament. Perfect Game for, for freshmen. They usually have it for like juniors and seniors and sophomores, but never for freshmen. Uh, you know, you went down there and you actually was the first person to set a record for the, the uh, miles per hour. You know, you hit 90 miles per hour. I think you was like 14 and 15 years old. Yep. And it was never heard of. It's all the state of Florida, all throughout Perfect Game, all throughout the world. Nobody seen a, a 14 year old hit, a 14, 15 year old hit 90 miles per hour on the gun. And you got very popular with that. Like, you know, you know, at that point when you hit that record, and everybody came to you. Which, by the way, actually somebody broke it. It took them like years to break it, but they finally broke it. It broke it by, by two miles an hour. Yeah, but it stayed for it stayed over 10 years. But how did you feel? You're 14, 15 years old. You was the first person to set the tone that it took 10 years to break. Honestly, well, that's a loaded question. First off, like, you know, I knew it was going to be broken with time. With time, I knew, like, I was, I was going to give it next year. But with the, the way baseball analytics and, like, the baseball – uh, the the way new coaches teach, and now that the the major now the way internet works, you teach major level major league level techniques to a ten year old, and it's, sometimes it just clicks to pe with people. Then they go into their freshman year, they click, and then they throw harder than every any freshman you've ever seen before in your life. So like, it's a different day and age. Ten years ago, like I was just throwing as hard as I could till my arm fell off. Like <laughs> yeah. over over here, kids actually have proper mechanics which it's, it's it's a little it's different now so i'm glad i'm glad it, I'm, i mean if it, if it wasn't broken for that long i'd be concerned for the game of baseball but i mean honestly they probably just didn't meet jamil or jermaine back then because they were still throwing fucking hard back then <laughs> but um answer your uh, answer your question with tri-state like with the joe barth it all goes back to joe barth because he when he was he was at that game when I hit 90 miles an hour, and he was really like, he was, for some reason, he was very invested in me, like very invested in me personally. And um, he would, he would just egg me on. He's just like, dude, like, he's just like, dude, I need you to like, I need you to just not give a shit. You need to like suck it the fuck up. Like he would just like cut, full on cuss me out. Like I'm like a four, 13, 14 year old on the mound. He's like, I need you to suck it the fuck up, and I need you to just rear back and throw it as hard as you can. I don't care if it, where it goes. I don't care if we lose the game. <laughs> like, I don't give a shit. Like, I just need you to just suck it the hell up and just throw it as hard as you can. And then next thing you know, I go from throwing, like, 72 to, like, 78, 85. And he's like, harder, harder, harder. I still remember to this day, it was on a backfield in the middle of, I think it was Fort Myers. It was in the middle of Fort Myers. It was on a backfield. It was, like... 
I still remember the scenery. I still remember Adam Holland was there, Schneider was there, Buddy Kennedy was there, uh, Rora, I think Brandon Rora was yeah. there, like a lot of Colin Palouse, he was there. No, Palouse was young, young guns. Um, anyway, like I just threw it as hard as I could, and I was like 89. He's like, there we go, one more, one more. I threw 90 miles an hour, and I hit it, I hit it once, didn't hit it again. And he's like, okay, good. I'll take your ass out now. And then <laughs> took me out, and then I had to ice my arm. I, I, could, I couldn't pitch. I couldn't even pick up my arm. He's like, see, I told you you could do it. You just got to suck it the fuck up, and you just got to throw it hard. I don't care where it goes. Like, take your nerves out of it. Just pitch. He's like, you got to. Like, and that was the first moment. I wish I took that moment in the right way. I took it the exact wrong way. It was weird because he's like, see, I told you you can do it. And then I got all hyped up. I threw 90 miles an hour. People were like, dude, you throw hard as shit. That's awesome. And I took it the wrong way. What I should have taken it is like, dude, like, I know, like, I know you could do it. Like, this is how I take, this is how I did take it. I took it as like, damn, I know I could throw hard. That means I could throw harder. And I just kept trying to throw harder and harder and harder and harder. My mechanics fell like. I threw harder, my, but my mechanics fell. My my ego got more brittle, and I wound up throwing 94 like within the same year because I just kept trying to throw hard and hard and hard. Really, what he was saying is like you can do anything you set your mind to. Like now, you just have to control it. Like control that beast. Like that's what he was trying to say. Like control the beast. Get in the zone. Throw 90 miles an hour in the zone. In the zone. In the zone. Like. I wish I wish I took it the wrong. I wish I took it the right way because I took that definitely the wrong way. I think that's what led me to having a long term slump. Like I didn't figure shit out until I was a junior in college. Like, like I, <laughs> Whoa, I don't know about all that. Like in terms of consistent, <laughs> yeah. In terms of consistent being in the zone, throwing strikes, I didn't figure shit out until I was a sophomore. No. Yeah, sophomore, junior in college. Like, that's, like, when I really figured it out. Well, let's get on to, to, to the rest of it because after that, you know, you start getting colleges start contacting you, uh, sending letters. At I this age. a lot of regrets with this. Well, I mean, at, at this age, like, I don't think you really knew. So, like, you know, you know me and your mom handled it. It was more like me. Like, okay, you got this letter, you got this letter. Come, come this camp, come this camp. So we're trying to send you all over the place. We're trying to get you there. We're trying to get you there. You know, it was tough. Um, you know, but then you had, to, you had to go into high school. Now, this is when, you know, you was with your friends at Magnolia. Uh, but I made the decision it was better off if you went to a better school. Uh, Camden Catholic um, you know talk to your mom about it she was like listen that's up to you it's now talk to you about it talk to you into it um, but before I say my say like how did you feel about when you graduate Magnolia you're supposed to go to Sterling High School to be with your friends but you got talked into going to Camden Catholic. You can be totally honest. Like, how do you feel about going to Camden Catholic? Oh, well, actually, you know what? I actually wish I, um, I wish I stayed. I wish I stayed. I like, I like really bad. I wish I stayed. See, at Camden Catholic? Why? I thought mean, <laughs> you didn't like it, dude. It's not that. I was just, I like, if I had, it's just different. Like, I, I wish I had. This is like, I just wish I had the mindset I had now. Like, I know, like I'm gonna, I know I'm an adult now. But if I had the mindset I had as a junior, where I just didn't give a shit, I was just like, like even, <coughs> even after pro ball, and like just, just like, dude, I just don't give a shit. Like, I just wanna, I just wanna get better. Camden Catholic had a good coach. His name is Bob Burkholtz. And he was a good coach. Knew what he was doing. He had a plan for me. I, I like I was about to start on varsity within the year, and I remember I transferred in the middle of baseball season. I didn't get to play the rest of the season because I was so. Even back then, I played basketball. I worked out in that dungeon, which was Camden Catholic's gym, which was horrible, and 
I just had a, the only the, a lot of regrets that I had was I wasn't confident. I wasn't confident outside baseball. I was I didn't I didn't speak with a lot of conviction. Um, I was very sheltered. So like I didn't really not that not sheltered. I was more like just family oriented to a fault, where I would only hang out with my family and the people that I grew up with. So like naturally when I would meet more people, I would just kind of revert to my own self, just be to my to myself. Right. And uh, it made me like, ostracized and like that weird like like that weird personality that would have been accepted at Sterling is now like being ostracized at this this new school and they're just like I was bullied for it. Like people didn't like me because of it. Like I was goofy and like I, I played bit and the only redeeming quality I had was I played baseball. Like, and then when people figured out I played baseball, I started to get more merit and I started to get like cooler with the, like the people. And I used to take the bus with a guy, like uh, with a couple people named Kenny and everything like that. And it, it was, it was fun. I wish I stayed in that league cause it was just so much more competitive than it was in Sterling. Like I felt like I would have learned more. I would have, I would have like grinded more. I would have, like I would have, I would have like just, I would have did a lot better. I, I just think Sterling was just it was comfort, and I needed to get myself into a more uncomfortable situation. I never really talked about this, like about my view on high school. Like high school, like I didn't really, I didn't really care about like. All I cared about was just where what school was going to get me the farthest. Right. It was either Bishop Hustis, Gloucester Catholic, or Camden Catholic. Those yeah. are the three schools that I thought were going to get me the farthest. And I really, I really had a big regret about going back to Sterling. I wish I should have stuck it out. I wish I could have stuck up for myself a little bit more, hung around the people that actually gave me time, instead of going back to what I already knew and sticking with high school like it's sterling sterling's educational system in term like in comparison to camden catholic wasn't that wasn't that much better and on top of that like it was just just walking down memory lane like i didn't go to parties like it was, it was cool i'm not gonna shit on sterling because sterling is a good school like they're very forward thinking like they're it's a cool environment like but their coaches sucked. Like they just they just sucked, and I didn't. I wasn't gonna learn anything from that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was gonna I was gonna ask you about that. Like so, so you left Cameron Catholic. You know, you transferred in the middle of your freshman year, and you couldn't play because you was ineligible because you were already because you actually he actually played one inning. If you play one inning or more on a varsity team, anytime you transfer, you have to sit. So, and that was the thing too about that shit too. Like I was doing so good in Camden Catholic. Like I was already hitting like I was above five hundred. I was I was throwing. I was pitching pretty decent. Like I wasn't doing. I was doing okay. Like, I was doing okay for pitching, but for hitting, like I hit. I already hit two home runs on the year. I was hitting the roofs on houses and. Everybody's like, dude, you hit fucking far. And I'm like, why the fuck am I leaving? Like, like these guys, I'm getting respect. I'm gaining credibility. I'm, I'm getting stronger. I'm getting more confident. And then the moment I, like, I just leave because it got too hard. And yeah, because like, yeah, you came to us and said you, you didn't want to be there anymore. Yeah, I just I didn't want to be there anymore. And I just, like, I wish I just toughed it out and just stuck it through sophomore year and just, like, got varsity time and and play with Burkholtz more asked him more questions and just like uh, damn but yeah that's that's my opinion on it i like i did so well to just give it up that easy like, like gats was there dude he was playing like gats but back then like now he's in with the major leagues yeah he was playing in that league too so i'm like why the fuck am i not staying <laughs> hey well Stupid. you know what you know but but you left cam McCaffrey, you went back to sterling you had to sit uh, you with the team a little bit, but you couldn't play. Uh, you could practice with them, but you still couldn't play. But then you finally had your sophomore year. Uh, do you remember anything about your sophomore year? Because it was actually pretty interesting. It was like, it was pretty interesting, if you can remember. I don't know if you remember or not, there, there was those back, you had the back-to-back -back no hitters. And Sterling? Yeah, it was a sophomore year. Your yeah, back -to -back no that. that was in the uh, uh, that was in the Sterling little local newspaper. Yeah, you had back-to-back -back no hitters, and 
I mean, really good that season. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you yeah, pretty decent. I I I don't know how much you remember. It was up and down. I remember like that was the peak of my season. Did horrible at hitting. Um, that did decent in pitching, but the back to back no hitters is why I got the starting spot, and I slowly fizzled out in hitting. Yeah, because we had to go through a whole thing, and then I had the idea I had to get you stronger. Uh, If you remember. Uh, I, I got the idea right uh, um, 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 from, from uh, Joey P's mom, Wendy, about taking you to, um, damn, what's that? The strength and conditioning shit up Cressy. there. Cressy. Cressy Performance. And I took you up to Massachusetts, and I couldn't go in with you. They, they trained you how to strength and condition, lift weights, cardio, all that shit, and you got into it like, like so, when you when you did that Cressy program, if like, you can remember, like you was really into it. Like, did you, like how how was that program for you? I don't think I would have did anything different now that I think about it with the Cressy performance stuff. Yeah, because it taught me how to lift with a purpose, and it actually gave me a plan. I just was I went in the gym. I was just like did bicep curls, and uh, like I just left. Like, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to lift. Nobody taught me how to lift. I kind of slacked off in gym classes. I didn't really, like, know how to do it. I didn't want to injure myself because it was, you know, I was playing in the game that day. And Cressy, like, taught me how to engage my glutes, how to, like, engage my scaps, and, like, really, like, taught me how to do everything from scratch. Like, just, he's like, screw it. Like, you don't know anything. Like, you're going to do how, you're going to do a squat without weight, and I'm going to see how you squat. And I took off my shirt, took off everything, and he was just like, well, your posture sucks, and your posture's in like this and that and this and that. He's like, this is how I can fix it. This is it, this is that. He gave my dad the price, and I ended up paying for it. Like, <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of money, too. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was good. I love I loved Cressy. Like, I think uh, seeing Cre- Cressy himself, he's a little bit of a nerd, mm-hmm. but he's, he's, a cool, he's a cool guy, man. Like, and then he opened up the facility in Florida where uh, Jermaine and Jamil went when they moved to Florida, and I wouldn't, do a, I wouldn't do a thing different. Then we went up a second time to get an updated one. I remember that. That was after uh, the Cape Cod League. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that, too. Now, back off of baseball for a second. When, right, because... You said earlier, right, you regret going back to Sterling. You said you should have stayed at Cam and Cappet. So when you got back to Sterling, you got back with your old friends. Like, only you can tell this one. You know, you got back at the end of, I guess, your freshman year all the way up to your senior year. Like, how was that for you when you finally got back to being around the kids that you grew up with and new experiences? Like, just the school, not baseball. Like, you there at Sterling. In your high school year how, how was that for you because only you know that for sure i mean i don't think the kids were the problem they like the the people were the problem i think there were good people there through and through i just wish i applied myself a little bit more i think i got intimidated by being in sterling like i just again it's the expectation like brandon was the coolest one in magnolia so naturally he's going to be the He's going to be one of the coolest in Sterling. So it's just like, I'm like, damn, like don't, nobody even said that. But now I just made that up. And I'm just like, dude, I, I just wanted to go into a school with a blank slate and kind of build myself up, build my own reputation and just start from the ground up to see who I really am. And it kind of like, I didn't know who I really was. Like I went in there with the old, oh, like goofy Brandon, he's back. And like, oh, la, la, la. I'm like, dude, like I'm... Like, my mindset's completely different. I wind up faking it. Like, I wind up, like, like faking to people who I was. Like, oh, this goofy kid that all he does is just tell stupid jokes, laugh, and does stupid shit. I'm just like, that's just, that's just not me. Like, like I'm, not, I'm, not that, I'm not that guy. Like, I'm, I'm more serious than that. I'm more, like, deep thought. I'm more deeper thought than that. Like, like I had an opportunity, like, like Carolyn Shinseki, she was var- valedictorian, salutatorian, I think it was, I'm not, I don't think it was Howard Jones, but I'm not sure, but one, like, I was like, dude, I could have strived to be valedictorian if I just pl- applied myself a little bit more, I could have did a whole bunch of things, like, if I just applied myself and didn't really fall back on my, like, stereotype that I created for myself, 
and it really held me back. Like it, it held me back. I didn't, I didn't really get over it till my junior year until like I just went full baseball mode. And I just like just used school as a catalyst to use it as a free gym, you know? Like I just, I really wish I stayed in Camden Catholic because like I could have built my own reputation. I could have went through that sucky part of freshman year when I was awkward trying to bust out the kinks and really figure out who I was build rapport with the team because I was starting to get friends on the baseball team like I'm like dude like what the fuck am I doing like the same dudes that were clowning me on the beginning of the fall are the same dudes that are high-fiving me saying dude you're so cool you're so awesome I'm like dude like I like I re that was one of my biggest like regrets that like I, I haven't really thought about it till now wow that I didn't know I, I, I'm telling you, all this stuff you're telling me, I have no idea. I'm, I'm glad you tell me because I'm telling you, when you're talking about it, it ends it. You can get it out your system, it ends it. So you don't have, you don't have nothing to worry about no more because it's done. It's the past. But back to the baseball part of high school, I know you went to uh, the uh, Cape Cod League. You tried out for that. You tried out for the... Uh, what was that? The uh, that big the, 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 the one you met Jamil. Code. The area code, the big leagues, the this and that. You know, you had colleges coming at you, uh, pro scouts coming at you, all that stuff like that. Now, you know, it, it, we could talk all day about Cape Cod and the area code and stuff like that. I, mean, I think area code is the most important part of my career. Okay, well there you go. When you went to Erico tryouts, because that was that that was a tough. It was an up and down journey, that was, trying that to even was. trying to get to it, and actually competing with these kids. These are the best kids in around the region and some around the country, trying to get on this team. Now you got an invite, which is that was good, but, but talk that was, about that. That was the most emotional. Dam that was the most emotionally damaging loss I've ever had in my entire life. Like, not even, like, adult, whatever. Like, that was the most adult, emotionally damaging part of my life because I just kept going along. Like, I thought I was a shit, thought I was a shit. And then I just got served just hum just being humbled three times in a row. Like, not, like, I got, I got, like, I didn't even survive past the second tryout. Like, that showed me the first tryout, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to see that much talent on display. That was the first time I saw that I was not special. And I was just like, shit, like other people are throwing 96 and they throw for strikes, all three pitches. What makes me special? And I'm just like, dude, I throw 96, but like I have a decent slider at the time. My changeup sucked and I couldn't really throw it for a strike. And when I got up to hit, couldn't hit because you're either a pitcher or a hitter at that point and sorry and that's that that was a real hit to my my ego like I, I like was crippled after that then when I went back the second time like it was even worse like it was it was worse I was just like dude like I'm so close and I went back to the second trial because like I passed the first round it's a lot of people got picked out of the first round. Second round was kind of like a second look at certain people. And it was just emotionally damaging that I, this, this guy, I, I remember him too. His name's uh, Mario Ricciardi or something like that. And it was between me and him to go. And I walked somebody. And then I led into another walk and another walk. And I struck out the side. And then he struck out like three times. I'm like, dude, there's, there's, I'm, I'm going to get picked. And I found out his dad's like one of like the highest ranking coaches. <laughs> and I'm just like, dude, this is bullshit. But Jamil went and he had a great time. So I'm happy for him. Um, he deserved it. He deserved it too. But that was like, um, that was the moment where I was like, dude, I need to, I need to throw strikes. I need to, I need to get my slider right. I need to get a good change up. I, like these guys are just too good. Like I, I can't. Like I might be number, I might be number one on jersey, number one in jersey on paper, but that doesn't mean shit when you can't perform. Like rankings don't mean shit. Uh, what they say about you in articles don't mean anything. You're only in baseball. You're only as good as your last outing. Like, that's the truth. Like I was good 
for a long time and then my last outing I was like damn like what happened like I, I honestly like area code was the moment where I just I looked at myself internally and like what do I want out of this sport like yeah. what do I want and I didn't know and that's why I struggled so bad until I then turned it on I think that summer when I was 16 and I threw 97 for the first time yeah I remember and then Evo Shield King yeah, I mean, you know, look, I, I, I Brand, you played on so many teams. We, we you, you could talk about that all, all day. I get it because the, the Canes, that was a good spot for you because you actually you was on a very established program. You got to travel for the first time. So, so like in a short Too version, much. with the Evil Shield Canes, like how was that experience for you to really branch out on your own? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching the show. Please subscribe, click on the bio, support the show. Thank you so much again. We'll see you next week for another amazing episode on Let's Talk About It.